Ministries. We're very excited to bring you this interactive experience where you'll hear from SCNM alumnus Dr. Alan Christensen about his latest book, The Adrenal Reset Diet. My name is Eve Adams, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Before we begin, let me take a moment to familiarize you with the technology that we'll be using for today's webinar. Hopefully you're seeing uh, my screen and you're seeing an image of the control panel. Make sure that your control panel is expanded as that is what you'll use to interact with us on the webinar today. You'll have the opportunity to ask questions and to do so, you'll type your questions into the box indicated here. Your questions will be answered verbally after the presentation is complete. Today's webinar will run approximately 60 minutes, about 40 minutes of presentation, followed by about 20 minutes of questions. During this webinar, you'll be hearing from SCNM alumnus Dr. Christensen. Alan Christensen is a Phoenix-based naturopathic medical doctor who specializes in natural endocrinology with a focus on thyroid and adrenal disorders. Dr. Christensen was a member of the premier class of SCNM graduating in 1996. He's the author of the New York Times best-selling book, The Adrenal Reset Diet, The Complete Idiot's Guide to Thyroid Disease, and Healing Hashimoto's, A Savvy Patient's Guide. As a child raised in rural Minnesota, Dr. Christensen was an avid reader. He loved spending time with his family's encyclopedias and medical textbooks. His body, however, was a source of struggle. Cerebral palsy left him with seizures, poor coordination, and eventual obesity. A devastating comment made by a classmate in seventh grade gym class spurred him into action. He became determined to reset his health and his life. Over the next few weeks, he devoured dozens of books on nutrition, fitness, and health, and created his own recovery plan. Dr. Christensen gave up sugar and developed an exercise routine that was easy enough for him to start on. He stuck with it and built on. With no prior sports experience, he became a varsity football player and his class's best endurance runner by ninth grade. This experience taught him that being healthy transformed both how you feel and how others treat you. He also learned that the tickets to health were knowledge and persistence. Dr. Christensen frequently appears on national TV shows like The Doctors and The Today Show, as well as print media like Shape Magazine. When he's not maintaining a busy practice, his favorite hobbies include mountain unicycling, technical rock climbing, and watching the stars. Dr. Christensen lives in Scottsdale, Arizona with his wife and their two children. We're so fortunate to have Dr. Christensen with us today to talk with you about his book. And before um, I turn it over to him, and I know many of you are, of course, familiar with naturopathic principles, I always think it's nice to start our webinar with a reminder of these. Um, and I know that Dr. Christensen will, will speak to these as he addresses his book. So as you know, naturopathic doctors use natural therapies rather than synthetic drugs to heal patients' lives. And Dr. Christensen's book is certainly an example of that. So with that, um, I will turn it over to Dr. Christensen. Thank you again, Dr. Christensen, for being with us today. All right. Thanks so much for having, having me, Eve. I'm really glad to be here with you all. Get slide back up. Here we go. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and congratulations to you for being accepted to SCNM and for those of you who are looking at SCNM and strongly considering your career in naturopathic medicine. You know, I was I was in your place a couple decades ago, and it was just one of the most powerful changes throughout the course of my life. And over those last 20 years, the whole outlook and the, the world and the culture that we live within has changed so much, and really all in ways that are favorable to what we're doing. This whole concept of natural medicine and eating well and organic food, it's so much more understood and accepted and mainstream than it was in, in the past. And this is just a perfect time for you all to be entering through the profession. There's just so many opportunities. So I really wish you all the best in all your endeavors. And any way I can support you along the way, I'd be glad to do so. I want to talk about something that might seem really obvious. <laughs> why do people become obese? Why, why do people gain weight? It's a big problem. Let me give you all a sense about the real scope of the problem and how prevalent obesity is becoming really throughout our whole world and about what are the things that give rise to it. 
we've got some current ideas that are pretty deeply entrenched. Most commonly we think about genes being a culprit or people just having too many calories that they're getting compared to what is being burned by their bodies. And we think about willpower as being a factor too. I want to take just a moment getting into this and talk about some of these beliefs and you know their merits and their limitations. We see these things show up uh, even, even in public policy. So for example, our public health messages talk about weight being a function of calories in versus calories out. And we'll talk more about the calorie model and its strengths and weaknesses, but the messages come down to a matter of just trying harder and needing to burn more calories, consume fewer calories. You know, the CDC has said that really it's coming down to choices and that if there's problems in terms of weight, it comes down to the choices you're making. You know, looking at what you're eating and drinking and looking at what you're burning and changing that. Uh, and I want to back up and evaluate what we're looking at with weight in terms of trends, how, what's happened and what we're projecting in this coming future. And when we see the trends, it gives better context about the prevailing beliefs about weight, what gives rise to it. So here's a, here's a brief model of an early trend. <laughs> I'm a space nut. I mentioned about watching the stars. And you know, when I grew up, this was the time of the Apollo missions. Uh, Carl Sagan Cosmo show came on when I was in sixth grade. And I was really bit enamored by these things all along. Uh, this was the day the Apollo 8 launched. One of my prior office managers gave me a book. It's a Time magazine that shows the cover of The Man on the Moon. The cover story is The Man on the Moon. It's from 1969. It's one of my most, most prized possessions. And there's this big article showing this launch taking off. So Apollo 8 was not the first one that put a man on the moon, but it was the first time that people had seen the far side of the moon. They orbited the moon and saw some photos of it. But there was all these images about the mission, and one of them was this crowd that was watching and taking a look. And I saw this picture a lot of times with a vague sense there being something odd about it, but not really being clear what it was. And boy, after some time, it finally hit me. The average BMI, the average body mass index in this crowd, everyone's really lean, very unusually lean. And there's some bigger shots that show the crowd that are really the same. Everyone's pretty skinny by today's standards. And I found some stats. At this time in 68, the average 45-year-old male weighed 168 pounds. That was, that was typical. And we'll move forward and look at where things have come today afterwards. Um, I was working in a natural foods co-op before attending naturopathic medical school in the early 90s. And a news story that I read inspired me to write an article back in 1990 when this image first came out. What, what happened was they've tracked the rate of obesity in the states in America for some time. 1990 was a real big milestone because for the first time, one of the states exceeded 15% adult obesity. And I should mention, I, I use the term BMI, or body mass index. It's a pretty crude measurement. It's really just a mathematical function of height to weight, how heavy you are per how tall you are. And there certainly are a lot of limitations to it. You know, someone could be a bodybuilder and maybe not that tall, but quite heavy. So there are ways in which the BMI is not perfect. But a lot of data has shown that it's a really strong predictor of chronic disease, you know, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, stroke, total longevity, dementia, uh, liver disease. So it's a really good predictor of that. And it's an easy thing to measure. So when you're talking about large populations, it's hard to have the most perfect medical data on everyone. But body mass index is an easy number to have. So we've got a lot of data about it being meaningful. And that's how we define overweight and obesity. You know, a BMI between 18 to 24 is considered normal. 25 to 30 is where we call the first level of overweight. And then 30 and greater is obesity, BMI of 30 and above. For most people's height, that's a substantial amount of extra weight, you know, often 10, 10 to 20 pounds for most adults. So 1990, one of the states exceeded 15% adult obesity. Unheard of, never happened before. Uh, Colorado was the leanest state. And what happened was they had to make a brand new color. And you can see Mississippi has a color that's distinct from all the other states. They didn't have a color for 15%. There was no category. So really, all throughout human history, 
there had never been obesity to this level of prevalence. You know, if you look way back, there's a few cases of kings that got gout and got portly on occasion, but there's historically never been trends of obesity before until this really, this time frame really started to emerge. So let's move forward. Um, in the year 2000, so check this out, uh, these are all brand new colors. So in 1990, what was the highest level of obesity by the year 2000 became the lowest level of obesity. So Colorado, which was at 6.7% in 19, which is 6.9% in 1990, has now moved up to 14.5%. Well, that was just about the high level that Mississippi had just 10 years prior. If you notice, Arizona has that same outlying color. Well, not by much. <laughs> Arizona, we squeaked by at 14.9% obesity by the year 2000. So in 10 years, what was the total unprecedented high watermark was now the low watermark. And this was incredibly alarming and shocking to the public health world. So let's keep on going. This is now over a decade old. Um, 2013, here's our most recent level of data. And if we look here, we see that we've got a whole lot of new colors. Now we've got no states below 20% obesity. So just a couple of decades prior, 1990, no states had ever exceeded 15%. Well, now we've got no states below 21% obesity. Um, and I'm going to show you all some projections about what's, what's coming. But let me just take you back briefly to the space crowd, because this is now 2013, so it's another comparison. So remember, he's, there's the folks that saw that Apollo 8 launch, uh, and this was back in 68. Uh, so here's, here's a similar group of spectators in 2010. This was one of the last shuttle missions, the, the, space, the space shuttle STS-131 mission. At this point in time, you know, this is not an unusual crowd. These, these guys look very normal. But contrast that to this crowd. So by the year 2010, when this was done, the average 45-year-old adult male weighed 200 pounds, a little over 200 pounds. So the average guy was 30 pounds heavier than he would have been when those first few historic Apollo spacecrafts were launching. And this is over not a long period of time. So if that's been the trend, what are the projections for the future? You know, what are we anticipating in the coming decades? And just to throw something out, projections can be thoughtful or they could be just blind extensions of math. What do I mean by that? Well, let's say that obesity went up by 20% per decade. Well, it obviously can't do that forever. We can't have more than 100% of the population obese. We can't have you know, 50 years out, 200% of the population obese. That's just silly. So you can't just blindly keep going at the same rate because that won't logically persist. So many researchers have put thought into it and knowing about the way trends do tend to slow themselves down, you can't exceed 100%, and they've come up with this projection for 2030. And this is pretty shocking stuff. So remember 1990 where Colorado was 6.9 and Mississippi was at 15. Well, by 2030, we're thinking that we're going to have two-thirds obesity. And this is not overweight. This is obesity. So two-thirds of the adult population medically obese in some of our states. And the Lima state being pretty darn close to half, pretty close to half of the adults being overweight. The, the strain on the infrastructure in terms of health care costs are just unimaginable. So a uh, thought that comes up quite a bit is like, well, okay, so Americans, we're, we often judge ourselves as being indolent and, and just Americans are thought of as being the ones leading the world in obesity. So here's some projections that were done globally. This is from the World Health Organization. Uh, by the same time frame, we're thinking that the global trend, so adults on planet Earth, the majority may be obese. Uh, there's a couple different trends here, but some are suggesting that it will be exceeding 50%, so 50.3%. So the majority of humans on the planet 
And again, not just overweight, not just a couple extra pounds. So this is obesity. I, I've played with some numbers that I've not put out in an official sense, but I spent some time Googling and just adding up. You know, there, there are some projections about how many lives we'll be losing from obesity by this coming decade and how much this will be costing the medical infrastructure in terms of death and chronic disease. And then I found the numbers for all the major wars throughout the world since 1800. So uh, I'm not a great historian, but a civil war, World War I, World War II, Vietnam, Desert Storm, uh, the Korean War, and you name it. And not just ones that America was involved in, but all the major wars in the planet. So it's just unfathomable how much lives lost and how much devastation and how much uh, mor morbidity you know, just uh, damage done to people, and then the cost, the expenses, unimaginable. But if you roll all that together, if you combine all the deaths from all the wars from 1800, we're going to be exceeding that number of deaths from obesity within this coming decade. And oftentimes things come down to cost. If that's not bad enough, just the lives lost, the projected cost so the expenses of all those wars since 1800 on the whole planet combined together, we think that the cost of managing obesity will be about six times greater than the cost of all the wars that we've had since 1800 combined. So this is just, I can't emphasize enough what a big deal this is, how much we really need to get it right to, to reverse, reverse this trend. Now I'll take some minute and talk to you all about you know, why, why this is important to me and why I care about this. Uh, Eve mentioned in the introduction a bit about my, my health early in life. I, I had seizures, which were thought to be secondary to cerebral palsy. Uh, my, my health was pretty poor as a child, and there have been some struggles that have stayed with me and have, have persisted. This has really thrown me into health, and I want you to think about why you are on the path that you are on right now. And what is it that's brought you into this and motivated you? You know, I've often heard that we've had people had maybe they've had your own personal crisis. Maybe it was that of a parent or a loved one that you were seeing firsthand just how poorly served someone can be by our current medical model. And maybe through effort, through work, you saw that things could work differently by looking beyond just drugs and surgery. You know, I was taken to doctors for my seizures, and I was given medications. I, I still am a pretty close friend of my dentist because of all the side effects that I've had intensively from the medications I was on. Uh, but what changed that for me was really simple dietary modification. You know, it turned out that some foods were big culprits in heightening my immune system, and avoiding them was a big part of reducing my seizures. The, the cerebral palsy was a big factor, too. Uh, physical activities helped out. And the, the real crux came about when I became an adolescent. You know, up, up to that point, I was a clumsy, nerdy, fat kid. <laughs> I was happy enough about it. I didn't really care. I, I geeked out in my space books, and that was my life. And I was fine with the fact that I really couldn't move. I was pretty, I was in shape, but, you know, if round counts as a shape, I was in shape. <laughs> but it wasn't that much of an issue until, yeah, adolescence. I started thinking about just, how others saw me, and others became more cruel and more pointed. And by today's standards, you know, I, I couldn't have made much money in a freak show. I wasn't that that big, but at the time, that was pretty uncommon. I really stood out, and I got called out on that quite a bit. And yeah, there was a crushing moment in a gym class that uh, was my my shape was really pointed out, and. The whole class was making comments, and I'm like, nope, this is just not okay. And it was really just data from books, and it was people who had written books who had been outside of the medical world that changed it for me. And, you know, I, I saw that my, my peer positioning, you know, how I was viewed, and then how I felt physically, just being able to move my body freely, it was so huge. And I thought, wow, if there's situations like this to where someone could have this radical of a transformation based upon data that a 12-year-old kid found in the library that doctors did not seem to have access to. And the plan was to go into medical school and then try to incorporate elements of nutrition and natural medicine almost like on top of a conventional practice just because I didn't know of any other model. 
I was close to this path when I learned about the naturopathic profession. This was when the concept of Southwest College was really in the inception stage. It did not yet exist, but it was exactly the profession I wanted, and the school was exactly the level of engagement and really the level of idealism that I was looking for. And it was just a perfect fit. I, I love being in the first class at Southwest College. I've loved being involved with it since then. I'm a huge fan of Dr. Mittman and the work he's done transforming the school and making it into what it is today. My practice became focused on thyroid disease because I saw that people with this condition really had a lot of the struggles that I had, but it was harder for them. You know, they needed more levels of correction before things that helped me would help them. So that became a real calling for me. And then I started realizing that along with thyroid disease, there's this huge crisis that's just affecting our globe with obesity that's larger than thyroid disease alone. So I was really happy to get a well, well-published, uh, best-selling book that dealt with that in a different way. So back to our topic, uh, I mentioned how genes are thought to be one of the big culprits. I talked about just the genes, the calories, the willpower. Well, what about the genes? You know, is that really the answer? Uh, simple thing, it's really not. There was one large study done of 44 twins separated at birth. And twins separated at birth offer a good insight on just how much genes affect something. You know, these twins that were separated at birth uh, were found to have many similarities. Uh, eye color, hair color, skin color, a lot of odd interests or tastes or habits. Their weight was completely unrelated, however. And these gals are an example of that. Uh, the twins had no weight correlation with one another at all more so than they would in a random population. Then we think about why, why did they have those differences? And the same study showed that the differences of the twins' weight tied to their adrenal hormone levels. We'll come back to that. That was one of the clues that I saw. So what about the calories? Is it just a matter of too many calories that people are getting? Well, yes and no. And here's what I mean by that. The, the public view is that Calories explain this. You know, they argue that uh, people who are heavier are consuming more calories than those who are not. You know, I mentioned it briefly that I was not a great historian. I'm not a great sports expert either. So, <laughs> but here's here's how to differentiate a description from an explanation. And I would argue the calorie model is a really good description, but it's a lousy explanation. So. Let's say that uh, I was a football consultant of all things, and I was consulting to a football team about how they could win more games. And they paid me money, and I came in and said, oh, okay, I've got this all figured out. And guys, sit down, I want you to take some notes. The trick to winning the football game is you've got to score more touchdowns than your opponents do. <laughs> so that's a very accurate description. That's, that's totally true. You can't debate that. But it's a pretty lousy explanation, and it's really a terrible basis for strategy. You know, everyone knows that, and everyone's trying to score points. And the same thing in the calorie model. When we look at how well that works as a strategy, it really falls flat. So the biggest analysis that combined all the large studies on calorie-based weight loss programs showed that they just don't work. You know, of those who actually lost some weight, 83% were a lot heavier afterwards than they were before they started. And if it just was a matter of eating fewer calories, why would this not work? I would argue that, yes, people probably do consume more calories, but that's we need to know why. And we need to take action steps about the why. The calories may be part of the description, but they really don't lead us to the strategy. They really don't help us understand what the problem is. So then the part that comes up is, well, what about willpower? You know, we're really taught that people who are heavy are because they're indulgent. And at some level, it's an issue of their temperament or their character, their personality, that they're not trying hard enough in some way or they're being lazier than they should. These are the messages that we talk behind people's backs. These are the messages people who are heavy tell themselves that they think must be happening if they cannot lose weight. But some of the tough part about this one is that animals are getting heavy too. And they're getting heavy just as much as humans are. One group of researchers evaluated 20,000 different animals over the last 30 years. And to be precise, 
This was between 1990 and 2010. Remember those state color maps, how they radically changed over the same time frame? Well, what they saw was that of all these different animals that they evaluated, 100% of the species had unprecedented weight gain. You know, people think, well, okay, so why did that happen? I guess maybe they're being overfed. Well, if you're talking about domestic pets, one could argue that perhaps pet owners were overfeeding them, or even animals that were in areas adjacent to human settlements, one could argue, well, maybe they're getting more processed food from the garbage. Okay. <laughs> that didn't seem to be the case, but even if it was, the part that really blew me away was that laboratory and zoo animals controlled diets. So if weight is a function of willpower, calories, or genes, what if you took an animal that had really the same genes as us, like 90% of our same genes, yet had no control of their diet and had no, no real change in their activity levels? If all those factors were together, those animals should not gain weight if our current models are even close to true. But that, that did happen. There, this, was, this was monitored. Chimpanzees between 1990 and 2010 have gained about a third of their body weight per decade. So about 60% over that time frame. So for a human, that would be about 10, 10 to 15 pounds per decade. And that's exactly what we've seen in humans. Now, these are chimps to where their food was counted, their activity, their exercise was controlled and regulated. These were not animals that were sneaking out for hog and dots and channel surfing all night. That was just not part of the equation. And I loved the synopsis that these researchers made from their work. They argued that the claim about obesity being a disease of willpower is now completely unsupportable. And I think the animal data really just nails that coffin shut, that this is not a matter of willpower. So if it's not simply genes, or calories, or willpower, well, then what is it? And what in the heck is going on? What's driving this big trend? So here's, here's what competing researchers are looking at as far as the main explanations. And the tough part is, there's really no big champions of research who are saying it's some combination of these things. Right now, there's many different people, each of whom will say one of these is the answer. And I was following all the studies, trying really hard to make this work. Some of these things could be more intuitive than others, like maybe the, the fructose, you know, part of processed foods. Some of them you wouldn't think, like the, the temperature control. So what does that mean? Well, it means we don't get cold at night as much as we used to. You know, over the last several decades, much of the globe has more central heating and cooling than it did in the past. We think getting cold at night was part of our bodies being able to regulate their, their own set point, their own weight. What also changed in 1980 was people began to have a higher rate of shift work. Shift work with an F <laughs> uh, by about a third. And that was part of the technology and global economies. A lot of folks were working on schedules that were not their local schedule. You know, I'm on the West Coast, and people that I see that are in financial industries, they may work on Wall Street schedule. And many people work on schedules based upon overseas. So more and more have insomnia. Pollutants, noise, toxins, changes in the microbiome, artificial lights. These are all things that individually seem to explain a lot of the crisis. But the tough part is that there's no one of these that explains all of it, but there's also no one of these that we could ignore. So at some point I finally realized, you know, it's not so much just one thing, but what could be a common thread? You know, what could be something that, that weaves throughout all these different triggers that's common to all of them? And I was stuck for a while without good clarity on what that would be. But I realized at one point, all these, all these elements are factors that act on the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the adrenal glands. And these things all trigger a state that we call dysregulation of this system. We also call this the HPA, hypothalamic, pituitary, adrenal axis, HPA for short. 
So this regulation of it was thrown off. Basically, the timing of cortisol becomes altered. And this is a real thing. It's, it's severe. Thankfully, it is reversible. It's not a disease that someone is stuck with. But it's also been shown to be pretty serious. You know, it appears to be a stronger risk for death than even smoking status or blood sugar or cholesterol or blood pressure. This is a huge thing that predicts how long people live, how healthy they are, and now we're seeing how, how heavy they are. So it's not a disease. It's not something someone is stuck with long term. I'm actually not a fan of the term adrenal fatigue uh, in this context. Some authors have written about adrenal fatigue, and that's really not what this is, because the adrenals are not rendered unable to make cortisol. They're able to, but what's happening is the system that regulates cortisol has changed, and that can be a matter of the body making more cortisol than it normally would. It could be less cortisol, like under the adrenal fatigue hypothesis, or it could be just perfect amounts of cortisol, but being made at the wrong time. So yeah, it's not that the adrenals are fatigued. It's that the full system of the adrenals at the thalamus and the pituitary are in a state of dysfunction. So what triggers that dysfunction? That dysfunction? Well, that's a combination of these factors. So these things together are bad enough, and the system becomes out of rhythm. The rhythm changes. And then we think about, well, if that happens, how, how would that affect body weight? You know, how would these circulating hormones change what someone would weigh? And how would this dysregulation really cause obesity? What we're seeing is that the adrenals, they make two hormones. There's cortisol and cortisone. And when the body's in a state of dysregulation, in a state of crisis, then there's more conversion. There's more stress hormones, more powerful ones being made at certain times of day. And this seems to affect the body to make it go into more of a storage state. So what happens is cortisone is making more cortisol than it would otherwise. And these enzymes are activated by all those triggers I mentioned before. And it's pretty wild. This, this whole thing has a rhythm all to its own. I'm going to call it the fat clock. And in some pretty, pretty amazingly brilliant studies, they've taken out visceral fat. So we've got the subcutaneous fat below our skin. Then we've got the visceral fat around our organs. You know, funny thing, my, uh, I'm heading off on a vacation here for a little bit. And we had to get our dogs some shots, get a shot up so we can stay at the doggy hotel where we're going. And as he was brought in, the vet said that he's, you know, he's, he should drop about five pounds. So <laughs> our dog's being put on a diet now, too, starting here today. But dogs, when they gain weight, there's no extra weight under their skin. You ever notice that? They don't have subcutaneous fat. And actually, no land mammals besides humans grow subcutaneous fat. So when dogs get heavy, they grow visceral fat. And all land mammals, if they get too much weight, they get visceral fat only. The only other mammals that gain subcutaneous fat are aquatic mammals, like you know, dolphins and whales. That's one of the fun arguments about humans having some ties to, ocean, uh, to aquatic regions and some of our ancestors, not not just being mermaids, but being actively getting food from, from nearby ocean regions. So quick aside, back to this. So visceral fat is making stress hormones, and it's making them in a rhythm. So you can pull visceral fat out of someone, and you can watch the timing of how it makes those stress hormones. You can keep it alive. And the larger someone is, the more the clock, the more the timing of when cortisone gets made to cortisol, the more that's out of rhythm with the body's main clock. And the worse that is, the more the person will be gaining weight. So the better that rhythm gets, the easier they can lose weight, especially that belly fat. So why would the body have this mechanism? And why would it get triggered so, so easily? Well, this is something we think is tied to our survival responses. So during times of stress or crisis, our ancestors often had less food. And if we think about this, humans were never the favorite, pre the favorite prey of any predators. 
you know, things like saber-toothed tigers or, you know, other, other larger African predators, we were never their first choice. So when they did go after us, that meant they had fewer of their first choice predators, you know, smaller, smaller mammal, mammals, especially the weakly or the old versions of them. And if they had fewer of those predators available, that meant that there was just less, less food for those predators, many of which were herbivores. So that meant it was a bad season, you know, just less biomass and less living things in general. So that occurred during times of possible famine. So if something wanted to eat us, that meant we probably weren't going to have food ourselves either, and there was less food available. So you've heard about the fight or flight response, and with that, the body also had things that would change to prepare for famine. Specifically, we would get a decrease in insulin sensitivity, and we would take more of our calories, more of our glucose, and we would convert that into visceral fat. I think of this almost like you could think of this in terms of economics, like say that your, your job is threatened and you get an inheritance. You get, you know, maybe $34,000 from some uncle you barely knew. Uh, and you might lose your job, unrelated things. But in that situation, do you go and buy, um, do you go to Las Vegas with that money? <laughs> or do you buy a fancy car with that money? Heck no, you put that in savings. or Maybe you get um, gold, gold bullion from it or you put it under the mattress, but you store it in some way to where you can access it, to where you're going to be able to have control of it and you'll be able to get to it if you need it because, you know, times might get really tight. Well, that's, that's how your body, your genes think when there's a heightened stress load, is your body interprets that as survival risk. And so rather than take those calories and just burn them through extra activity, your body is going to want to store those. And you're going to store those ideally, first off, as visceral, visceral fat. That visceral fat, that's the economic equivalency of just cash under the mattress. That's stuff that you can draw upon quickly and easily if times get really bad. So this is really part of the whole survival cascade. And people have called this the, the five Fs. There's the fighting, fleeing, feeding, and fasting. Well, sex is, you know, I'm not going to do the F on that one, but, but fasting, this is how our body is able to fast and survive, to survive with it, because we're taking our fuel and we're making individual fat. This is the whole cash under the mattress thing. And when we think about it in this perspective, it becomes really apparent why, why just regular dieting doesn't pan out, doesn't work very well. Just imagine this and think about it. So you're in a situation to where your body, your body's threatened, and your body feels a high stress response. And because of that, it's really hunkering down and holding on to calories. Now imagine the situation, you go on a diet. How is that going to help? You know, calorie restriction, that's only going to make your body confident that it's doing the right thing by not burning any calories. You know, your body's going to get that much more entrenched in this storage response and really just hold on to the fat even that much harder. Same thing if you ramp up your exercise more than you're used to. And then just think about the whole stress from being on a diet and not having your comfort foods and breaking your routines. It all makes it worse. And this leads into a vicious cycle. So stress and stress, I always like to think about it in a bigger sense. It, it does include mental emotional stress, but it also includes all those other causes that I showed before, things like the fructose, the temperature changes, the changes in the sleep schedules. Those are all stressors in the sense that they're pushing your body out of balance. And it's stressors in that broader sense, cumulatively, that creates this whole hypothalamic pituitary adrenal dysregulation. Well, this leads to fat storage. So when more of your fuel is going to fat, your body may want more of it. And studies have shown this. Studies have shown that if you're agitated, you're going to prefer different foods and different amounts of those foods as well. This can also make you more tired. So what happens here is all your fuel is being stored. You're not burning your fuel. So you've got less of it available for your muscles and your brain. That's going to make you physically tired, but it's also going to make you not feel as well. 
So when you're more depressed and more run down, what happens to your stress capacity? You know, how, what happens to your resiliency level? It gets worse. So this cycle then starts to really ramp itself up. You're less resilient, and the stressors you're facing already are met with that much worse and are affecting you that much more badly. So the solution is not starving. <laughs> and the solution is not taking someone who's struggling and making them run 10 miles a day starting tomorrow. That's going to make it worse. The solution is to really reset the system and get the body back to a whole different mode in which it can burn calories better. You know, I call this thriving. I call this adaptation. And in this state, you're not making as much cortisol. You're not making as much stress hormone by the visceral fat. Your body gets a natural rhythm of being more insulin sensitive, especially in the evening. We'll talk about that. That's kind of a unique thing. You also get better at making glycogen. So that's your energy. That's the stuff that makes your muscles powerful. And that sets up, rather than a vicious cycle, what I call a virtuous, a virtuous, virtuous cycle. So you get more stress resilient. The lipolysis means your body is burning fat better. When you're burning fat better, you can keep your blood sugar stable at night more effectively. And that means you sleep better. You're making energy more effectively. That's going to make you more productive. You're going to want to do things physically, mentally, socially. You're going to engage and connect better. And boy, that's probably the real secret sauce for making us more resilient and more stress adaptive is how well we connect. So now we're getting more resilient. And this keeps working in a good direction. So I'll walk you through my thought process of figuring all this stuff out um, best I can. The first part was seeing that, you know, pardon the, pardon the expression, but we were really heading the wrong way. The hell in the handbasket was the expression, but really heading the wrong way in terms of our global health. And then realizing that what we were doing about it and our beliefs about it really weren't helping. You know, that the idea of simple dieting wasn't making it better. So I wanted to figure out why it was happening. And I realized of all these factors, the threat is the adrenal rhythms. So then, well, what can we do about it? How can we reset these rhythms? You know, we can't change every single stressor in life. But what if, what if a simple diet could help improve that rhythm? That's my thought process. So I thought about cortisol. Cortisol and insulin, they fight each other. And I thought about how the ratio of proteins and carbs affected insulin and also affected melatonin. So all these big hormones, the cortisol, insulin, melatonin, they're things that can control cortisol. And I thought a lot about carbs, especially. How could you time them and use them in a certain way? Once I talk about carbs, people freak out because right now we're in a carb phobic phase, which is no different than the fat phobic phase we were in in the 80s. It's no, it's no more or less logical. It's just a phobic reaction. You know, many have thought that, well, don't they cause obesity? I don't take too much time here, but no, they don't. If you go two years out, whether you're low fat, um, high carb, uh, low carb, uh, high protein, low protein, it's all identical after two years unless there's any daily timing factors. Then I talk about carbs being more so at night. We have a little more detail on that. Then the common thought that I get is, well, if you're going to have them, shouldn't you have them in the morning? So think about this. Um, before, before major events, you know, this was prior to a Boston Marathon, the, the evening before an event, there's a dinner before a marathon. It's a classic ritual. It's not a breakfast before the marathon. It's a dinner the night before. <laughs> there was a big study that I really enjoyed. It was done with Israeli police. And they looked at changing carbohydrates to the dinner as opposed to earlier in the day. And what they saw with that in a big group of men, they, they tracked them for the course of six months. Uh, every measurement of body weight, waist circumference, markers of blood sugar control, uh, cholesterol, blood vessel inflammation, they all got a lot better when men ate the exact same amount of food and the exact same food but the carbs at night rather than in the daytime. So it was concepts like this that were brewing in my head when I put together the study. And the study was the real basis for the book. And in it, we did some, you know, we did some simple recipes for people and we did some real basic 
basic food ideas. We ended up with 42 participants, um, mostly women, uh, 45 years old on average, and we did the first level of tracking for a month. I wanted people that had really already done a gamut of diets. So the average number of diets these gals had tried had been uh, three in the last, five in the last three years that had not worked for them. We checked a lot of data gathering early on, uh, cortisol via hair, blood, urine, and saliva, a lot of common body measurements. And what we've seen is that there's, there's this rhythm, there's this slope that shows when the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis is not working right. This top line I call stressed, so the red line is cortisol above an optimal range. Then we've got like the, the crashed and the wired and tired were out of rhythm. And when we collected cortisol panels on these people, they were all off in some way. It was pretty dramatic, but not the same way, which was significant. The diet, you know, we cut out a lot of common toxins, made sure they got lots of fiber. The big differentiator was the fact that we did do carbs, but they were at night. There was a little bit in the breakfast. It was also distinct because we put a lot of weight in resistant fiber. So lots of resistant fiber, beans and legumes, and some other unique foods with it, but carbs ramping up as the day went on. Some simple sample recipes of like breakfast shakes uh, with small amounts of carbs, a little bit more. Chilled potatoes are pretty unique foods that have a lot of resistant fiber in them. Uh, and then a common dinner with like a turkey casserole, so a little bit more carbs in dinner. What we saw happen over the course of 30 days was pretty neat. Uh, people lost weight, and that happens on a lot of diets, whether or not they work in the long term, that can happen in the short term. But the part that really excited me was their cortisol rhythms got better. So what I measured was not just their cortisol scores, but how much their cortisol scores differed from ideal. You know, regardless if someone was too high or too low or backward, I made a composite score of how many points they deviated away from a healthy cortisol rhythm. And we saw in that first month by doing really nothing but the diet, we saw their cortisol scores correct by more than 50%. So the lows got higher, the highs got lower, the backwards got closer to regulated. And I really encourage participants not to change their exercise, not to meditate, not to start journaling. A lot of good things they could have done to help their cortisol rhythms. I encourage them not to do it. I wanted them just to focus hard on the diet and see what the diet alone would do. So that was what I need. The other big differentiator was that if you take a look at waist changes, we saw about a 5% reduction in waist circumference. So average of over two inches of waist loss in that first, that first 30 days. You know, weight loss is often talked about, but it's really waist loss that's the big goal. That's that reduction in that stubborn visceral fat. And that's a change that means health is radically improving. And We've been tracking people since, too. Here are some numbers we had a while back from the six-month follow-ups. By that point, the average weight improvement was 23 pounds. Uh, weight reduction, not, a rather common change was 4.1 inches, which is really big. And then about a 70% correction in cortisol rhythm. So I don't think that this, this diet is like the answer for the whole crisis. I think it's an idea, and I think it's really been helpful for people. I think it's a, a different way of understanding, though. And I think just that by moving away from the model about weight being an issue of laziness or bad food or gluttony, we've got to ditch that model. It's just not working. And I think by seeing it as really a stress response, a survival response, that can open up some new ways of thinking. The, the diet is one strategy that can work really well. I think a lot of you all got the book, and I talked about things along with the diet, like herbal adaptogens, you know, mind-body techniques, those are great as well. But I would encourage you all in your coming careers in nature of medicine to help this message move a lot further. And with the concepts about weight not being an issue of just laziness, but being a stress response, help figure out more ways in which we can reverse this for people. I talked about it in terms of weight, but this whole crisis, this is chronic disease. You know, this is all the big growing issue of chronic disease. So the more we can get this right, the more we can see health care improve and the costs come down. And you know, this whole thing about weight, it's, it's an epidemic now. And 
the more we can fix the body's stress resiliency, the better these things can go across the board. So I'd love to take some time and answer some questions for you all. And we can do some that are about the topic. Uh, there's about the profession. I'm happy to cover both. So I'd love to open up the questions at this point. Great. Thanks so much, Dr. Christensen. That was very informative. Um, so again, if you have questions, please type them into the question box um, in your control panel, and we'll answer as many as we have time for. And thanks to Dr. Christensen for being open to questions, both about the, the, his presentation, but also about the profession, as he's been uh, a part of it for many years now. Um, and so why don't we start with that question. Dr. Christensen, can you speak a little bit about how you've seen the profession change or evolve since you graduated back in the late 90s? <laughs> you know, at, uh, at that point in time, I, I was able to start out and get a great start and get good momentum. We weren't, we weren't as well known about. And even the concepts of natural medicine were, were very fringe. It was still it was still not as really regarded. And now, you know, look at what's happened with Whole Foods is a great analogy. Um, my, my father in law is a, a broker of natural food to a lot of big supermarkets. And what he's told me now is that honestly regular supermarkets, they're afraid of going out of business because most generation X and definitely generation Y and the millennials, they don't go to supermarkets anymore. They'll go to places like like we have Sprouts, or they go to Trader Joe's, they go to farmers markets, or Whole Foods. But the regular old supermarket model with more of the processed foods, that's just not being used. So, and we look at what happens among among those that that people follow, the celebrities, People Magazine. They're all eating organic food, and they all have doctors that are naturopathic and holistic and guiding them in those ways. It's it's now aspirational. So that's that's the thing is that, that's the biggest single factor I think is that culturally. These ideas used to be pretty fringe and out there and things that you really weren't proud of. And now it's completely aspirational. And everyone either does these types of practices or they want to and they know they should. So the momentum behind the belief change is just huge. It's now just really time to ride that wave for you all. Yeah. And so given that, have you also seen sort of a change in the patients that you see in your practice as far as being more informed and, and being open to more uh, you know, to your type of medicine. I mean, clearly they're open, they're coming to you, but how have, has your patient base evolved since you started practicing? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. They, they definitely have, and I think about people almost on a continuum with their level of, of personal health education. And yeah, the typical patients, they are much, much more savvy. So a lot of, a lot of things in the past that took a lot of explanation or discussion about you know, understanding why they would take herbs or why they would do a procedure, or why they would do intravenous nutrients. These are concepts that are no longer new to people. They Now they're thinking more about distinctions of why this versus another, or, or why this now, or why this model. And so they have much, much better informed questions. And it's, it's a different different demographic than it was before. And not, not because it's different people, because people themselves have shifted in their many are much more involved and engaged than they were in the past. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so Dr. Questionson, I think you may have addressed this a little bit towards the end, but can you speak a little bit more to the participants that were in your study and those that were able to reset their levels? Have they, have they been able to keep their levels consistent and their weight at a healthy number? They sure have. And the data that we're seeing six months out has, has persisted pretty well for the population. We're, we're several years out now, and the vast majority of them are ones that I still see you know, a few times per year. And, and along with them, we've been using the same model on, on many others. And we get, we get great feedback all the time about people who have struggled for decades of weight and tried all the diets. And we've had a lot of people to where they're eating more than they used to, and they were eating less food, and many to where they're eating a larger variety of food. The one thing that shocked people the most has been I've had a lot of people that were just just killing it in the gym, like just training their butts off, you know, hours a day and not getting anywhere. And in the in the book I talk about based on what your adrenal level is, the book has a simple quiz you can take and you can know what your current level of adrenal function is. And if it's not healthy, you don't want to be killing it in the gym. It's not gonna serve you. And I, I remember very vividly a few weeks ago a woman 
a woman who several months prior was just really frustrated. She was trying the diet, not getting anywhere. And I'm like, okay, let's talk about what else are you doing. Let's go through some basics. She goes, yeah, it's not working, and I'm still putting in an hour and a half in the gym each day, and I'm not getting anywhere. I'm like, ah, okay. So this will freak you out, but let's try not doing that. <laughs> and she was scared to death that she thought, well, no, if I'm training this hard and I'm still not losing weight, I'm going to blow up like a balloon if I quit this training. I'm like, well, I'm seeing your cortisol scores, and I know where you are. I know it's, it's been not working for you. I'd like to see you try this, to try to do a lot less and focus your time on doing some Pilates classes. You know, she had done Tai Chi before, so do some Tai Chi, do some light stretching. Follow the diet pretty exactly like we have been, but slow down in the gym. And I'm a fan of exercise. It's my favorite outlet. But some people can be in a place to where high-intensity exercise is not serving their body weight. So I saw her a few weeks ago, which was a couple months after making that transition, and she was just so amazed. She had been seeing her weight start to come down. She was pretty close to her target, and she was sleeping better. And she also noticed that her anxiety levels, she wasn't even aware of them being a couple before, but now she was realizing that they had come down a lot. She was sleeping better and you know, not as short with her kids, she was noticing. And, and yeah, it was a matter of just raising her resiliency and decreasing her total stress load. And from the calorie model, it wouldn't make sense from the idea of just burning more and eating less. But she saw in her own life that it, it made a difference and that things started to come around for her. Yeah, I, I love that story. I have uh, friends who, who you've described in that story that they work out a ton, work out, and are frustrated that they're not able to lose weight despite eating quote unquote healthy. So I will definitely be passing along your book to them because I think they can learn quite a lot from it. So thank you. Um, so one final question as we um, wrap up our time together. Um, so as, as you've mentioned, we do have some um, you know, prospective students on the phone. Any advice that you have to those that are considering entering this profession? Yeah, it's, it's such a wonderful thing. And it's, I don't know, I just can't express what a positive aspect it's been in my life. Uh, I've got a, a clinical practice that I love. There's a group of other doctors I've brought in, and we, we have this great camaraderie. Uh, we've got a staff that you know, we'd love to hang out with. The, the patients that come in, you know, I've, I've, known, I've known other doctors, and I mentored with some when I was considering a more conventional career before I knew about this. Uh, doctors have pretty poor rates of health and pretty poor rates of personal satisfaction. And working under a model of seeing long lists of patients for three to five minutes at a time, always being concerned about you know, liabilities and malpractice, I can see why that would be no fun. The other difference about more conventional medicine is that, you know, you, you really are following a cookbook. You know, there are, there are very clear clinical guidelines that come to you from the insurance companies you contract with. And it, it's a cookbook. You know, you've got to do what's in the cookbook. So there's really not a lot of room for the time to, to know someone at a deeper level or to really connect with them in terms of their level of stress or their resilience or what matters to their life. You don't have the time for that. And you certainly don't have the opportunity to, to think about things that are going to make a difference. You know, dietary change, lifestyle change, safe, natural methods, those aren't part of the cookbook. They're not part of the formula. But with an age bracket profession, you've got a community that supports you in that. And the people that come to see you are there because they want to see you, not because you're the person on the insurance list who's closest to their neighborhood. You know, they really are involved with that. So it's a very different level of, of interaction. And as you mentioned, I, I've written some books. That's been a wonderful experience. I, I love the, the contrast of really engaging with people and trying to figure out you know, medically what their needs are, but also you know, interpersonally, how to engage with them and how to positively influence them in ways that are going to improve their health. And then also to have time to withdraw strategically and then go back to the research and then think about crafting things in a literary sense. So you've got so many options available in the profession. You can do clinical practice. You can do writing. You know, I do some online work as well. Those things are available to you. There's lots of levels of training you can participate in. So it's, it's just a wonderful time for the profession. I, I couldn't, couldn't be a bigger fan. Wonderful. Great perspective. Thanks for sharing that, Dr. Christensen.
Um, so thank you again for taking the time to, um, to share with us information about your latest book um, and your insights into the profession. We're so fortunate to call you an alum, um, and thanks for all your support that you, that you provide, again, to the profession, to prospective students, um, and of course your patients. So um, for those of you that um, have not had a chance to get to know SCNM too well yet, just want to make sure that you are aware of different opportunities that are available to you. Twice a year we host a discovery day or an open house where you can come hear from uh, alums such as Dr. Christensen and others um, to learn more about the profession and how the medicine is impacting the lives of their patients. And our next one will be coming up in November, on Saturday, November 14th. So you'll start to, to get information about that in the next few weeks. And of course, we always invite students to come to campus to get a, a tour of our beautiful campus and see our beautiful new building. And we also offer a student for a day program where you can sit in on clinical shifts and sit in on classes uh, to get a better perspective on uh, life uh, as a medical student. So if you have any questions or uh, questions about SCNN, the admissions process, or the profession, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and we'd be happy to answer those. So thank you. Uh, let me thank again Dr. Christensen for spending uh, some time with us this afternoon and for his wonderful presentation. The presentation has been recorded and will be posted on our website in the next week or so in case you want to reference it um, or, or go back to any of the slides. So with that, I thank you, Dr. Christensen. I thank our participants for joining us. And that concludes this webinar. Thank you.